Alone in the emptiness of the mid-Pacific is the tiny island of Nauru, a United Nations Trust Territory. Administration is exercised by Australia on behalf of the administering authority. Australia, New Zealand and the United Kingdom. It is the home of about 2,500 Nauruans. I am Hamad the Robert, head chief of the Nauruan people. Our island is far out in the Pacific. We are basically a Polynesian people, but our beginnings and much of our history are lost in the past. Porda Lagoon has been used by the Nauruan people to grow fish which we call ibia. Long before European settlement of Nauru, our people caught these fish when they were very small and brought them from the reef to the lagoon where they grow to a size suitable for eating. The lagoon is owned by several families and each has the right to stock and fish their own section of this brackish stretch of water. Frigate birds are still caught and tamed as they were in earliest times. The tame birds attract the wild ones by flying with them, but returning to their perches, they lured with pieces of fish. Two men with weighted lines prepare to snare the unsuspecting bird. The ball game, Itiwe, was in former times the most popular Nauruan game and was taken very seriously with teams from north of the island competing against south. The ball must be driven with great speed and force. On festive occasions, the young men like to show their prowess in a traditional wrestling match. It's all good fun and nobody gets hurt. Like so many other people, the Nauruans are in a period of change. The change began when European explorers moved into the Pacific and was accelerated when phosphate was discovered here at the turn of the century. Phosphate is the only economic resource of the island and from it stem the improved living standards, health, education and other services enjoyed by the Nauruan community today. But mining phosphate is a huge and costly undertaking, 
depending on the resources of modern technology. In addition to the other benefits it brings them, Nauruans receive royalties on phosphate extracted from their lands. Much of the work is done by workers from the neighboring Gilbert and Ellis Islands and from Hong Kong. Treatment of the phosphate rock begins in Nauru. Phosphate rocks are fed into the crushing plant to be ground into small pieces. When the phosphate arrives at the works, the moisture it contains is removed. It passes through a system of dryers in the process becoming considerably lighter. Shipping phosphate from Nauru has problems and dangers peculiar to the island itself. There is no harbor and ships must tie up to buoys anchored in about 1,200 feet of water and within 200 feet of the reef. The massive cantilever reaching out over the ship pours 3,000 tons of phosphate into its holds every hour. The British phosphate commissioners are responsible for all mining operations. From Nauru and Ocean Island, the rock phosphate is shipped to the east coast of Australia and to New Zealand, where extensive factories process the non-productive rock. These countries are so situated that the comparatively short sea haul is a vital factor in the economics of the phosphate industry. But the actual extraction of the phosphate is the simplest and least expensive process in the manufacture of superphosphate, the life-giving substance which is developed from this barren rock. The process is firstly grinding the phosphate rock, then mixing it with a carefully proportioned amount of sulfuric acid. The latter attacks the insoluble phosphate and converts it to a soluble form. Complex chemical and mechanical processes are involved in converting the rock phosphate to superphosphate. A factory manufacturing superphosphate covers a large area. One to produce 100,000 tons a year has approximately six acres of buildings without taking into consideration roads and storage areas. Phosphate has made Nauru one of the most barren islands in the Pacific and for centuries forced its people to be fishermen 
instead of gardeners. It can, when processed, bring life from the soil. Back on Nauru, the task of administering the island is exercised by the Australian government. At the administration block, a memorial commemorates the gallantry of a former administrator, Chalmers, who was killed at his post during World War II. Nauruans work in every branch of the administration. All members of the police force are Nauruans, except the director. Justice in Nauru is exercised through three courts the District Court, the Central Court, and the Court of Appeal. In the District Court, both civil and criminal cases are tried by Nauruan and Australian magistrates appointed by the administrator. Nauruans charged before this court are usually tried by a Nauruan magistrate. Here, the magistrate is Mr. Raymond Gadabu. A modern, well-equipped general hospital is maintained and staffed by the administration. One emphasis is on child and maternal welfare. The population has doubled since 1946. Education is one of Australia's basic tasks in Nauru. There are many problems. The island's remoteness, language difficulties, and the needs of the many different people who live here, European, Chinese, Gilbert and Ellis Islanders, as well as Nauruans. At the primary school, there are over 300 children. Another 150 go to the Sacred Heart Mission Primary School. Pupils are taught in English. The administration provides a free bus service for all school children. The classroom is the training ground of the Nauruan leaders of tomorrow. Maggie Jacob is now a scholarship holder in Australia. The classroom is a threshold to more advanced studies which Nauru, because of its size and geography, is unable to give its children. To help promising Nauruan students go beyond the level of secondary education available on Nauru, the Australian administration provides scholarships to Australian schools. Knox Grammar School, Sydney, is one of the many famous Australian schools in which Nauruans have been enrolled. In the country environment of Moss Vale, New South Wales, Nauruan girls have interests outside the classroom as well as their normal classes. The Australian administration provides university education for any Nauruan student who can benefit from it. At the Australian National University, Canberra, a Nauruan meets his fellow students. He meets new people, 
experiences new ideas, sees new horizons. At Melbourne University, Lagamon Harris is studying engineering. Back on Nauru, technical skills are put to practical use. More and more Nauruans are being helped to take their place in the modern technological world where their future will lie. Apart from the officer in charge, the radio station is staffed by Nauruan operators and technicians. The Public Works Department is a practical training school for Nauruan apprentices and an avenue of employment for tradesmen. As their knowledge and skill increase, so they are taking over the tasks and jobs of work in the community in preparation for the life that lies ahead of them. Over 90% of the administration staff are Nauruans. Many of them play an enthusiastic part in community affairs. From the Nauru Cooperative Society store, run by the Nauruans themselves, they get fresh meat and fruit and most of the goods that go to make life worth living anywhere. Standards of living are high. The cooperative society has its own freezer and bakery, a smaller branch store and many agencies. Its directors are all members of the Nauru Local Government Council and the chairman of directors is the head chief, Hammer de Robert. The official meeting place of the Nauruan Local Government Council is the Dominiab. The council was constituted in 1951 to replace the Nauru Council of Chiefs, which had been established by custom. The council has nine elected members. From one of its members, a head chief is elected. In addition to powers which it exercises in its own right, the council advises the administration on any matters affecting Nauruans. Well, councillors, I think you will all agree that the most important problem on our hands today is the question of a future home for our people. When the phosphate supply is exhausted in 30 to 40 years' time, the experts predict that the estimated population then will not be able to live on this pleasant little island of ours. By that time, the present economy we are enjoying will not be available and the standard of living our people will have been used to will drop accordingly. It is necessary, therefore, to find a new homeland where the people could be resettled when necessary. The great majority of our people are in agreement with this view. There are some, however, who would prefer to remain on this island even when there is no more phosphate industry. Careful and intelligent thinking on our part is necessary. And of course, our decisions must be the wisest possible on these questions. And they should also be in the best interests of our people. Although the phosphate industry will continue for 30 or 40 years on Nauru, preparations are being made now for the future of the Nauruan people. Australia has offered them a permanent home within her own shores. The final choice will lie with the Nauruans themselves. Wherever they may decide to settle, the future lies with the children. They will benefit from the preparations being made now. Their prospects are bright. Their future is secure.
the people of Nauru look ahead to widening horizons. Oh, <laughs>